Welcome, and thank you so much for joining the World Affairs Council of Connecticut today to discuss the storm before the calm. We are thrilled to have with us this evening Dr. George Friedman, uh, joining us from Driftwood, Texas. Uh, George is an internationally recognized geopolitical forecaster and strategist on international affairs. He is the founder and chairman of Geopolitical Futures and New York Times bestselling author of many works, including The Next 100 Years, The Next Decade, and the inspiration for this evening's conversation, The Storm Before the Calm, America's Discord, The Coming Crisis of the 2020s, and The Triumph Beyond. And we will put a link in the chat. We encourage everyone to pick up a copy if they don't already have one. Um, Dr. Friedman, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us this evening. Delighted. Uh, the World Affairs Councils, I have a special place for. I was at the board of the national, and it's like home to me. We're so thrilled to have you here with us. And uh, to everyone joining us, my name is Amanda Jolly, VP of Programs at the Council. And today's structure will kick off with a conversation with Dr. George Friedman and Megan Torrey, CEO of the World Affairs Council. Uh, so now let's get started. I'm pleased to turn it over to you, Megan. Megan Torrey, CEO of the World Affairs Council. Thank you, Amanda. And thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, I want to give a big welcome to everybody in the audience, and I know we have friends. Um, George is a great friend of the World Affairs Councils, uh, you know, having served on the national board, and we have um, members not only joining us from here in Connecticut, but I know friends in California and Alaska joining us um, tonight and this afternoon as well. So thank you, everybody. George, such a pleasure to have you here. Great. Good to be here. Um, and interestingly enough, we were talking beforehand, we are experiencing sort of the same weather in Texas and in Connecticut today. So uh, <laughs> I think that's, you know, something we have in common. We are talking tonight about the storm before the calm. Um, and I encourage everyone to pick up a copy of this book. I know that in the chat, you'll have a link to where you can purchase it. Um, so George, tell us about, um, why you wrote this book and um you know tell us tell us tell us about the premise of the book well i started writing this book in a bar in 1975 <laughs> as i put it we were sitting there decrying the past five years with some guys and we were talking about the race riots that had broken out uh the police killings uh the police were called pigs uh the riots at the chicago uh democratic convention, uh, the economic turmoil. It was a terrible time, including a president who was forced out of office as a criminal. So the question that we asked that I asked is, has it ever been that bad? And everybody else got drunk and I was still sober. So I took out a piece of paper and I started writing about when the last time they were. And they were Jackson's period Rutherford B. Hayes and Gold Standard and William Jennings Bryan, the Depression. Um, and it's turned out that it had a 50-year cycle. Now, why it had a 50-year cycle, I had no idea. But when I took a look, the same things were there. Intense race tension on various sides. Uh, violence within the country. Uh, a sense that the nation had was collapsing and could not survive. And when it came to 2015, uh, I said, okay, 2020 should be the point where it blows up again and we go through that cycle. And so I started writing it and I found that it was very hard to write about your own country. I spent most of my time writing about foreign countries. Writing about your own country is really tough. It's like writing about your children. It's not easy, but what it was clear to me was that we were heading towards somewhere around 2020, a really unstable period with all the things that we had before. And so, you know, I wrote the book and I placed 2020, which hadn't yet happened in the context of the last time we had a transition, which was 1980, mm -hmm. when the Roosevelt period came to an end and Ronald Reagan was elected president and a very different America emerged. And I said, okay, well, 2020 is where the crisis will begin, just as it began in the 1960s. And the next 10 years or so are gonna be hell. And here we are. Exactly. 
So let's dive into the book a little bit deeper. So um, you sort of break down um, patterns in the book. So uh, 50 year socioeconomic cycles, and then um, sort of uh, 80 year so more historical, um, you know, institutional. Cycles. Yeah, institutional cycles. So let's start with the 50 year social uh, socioeconomic cycles. You know, can you can you tell us about the pattern that we're in now, um, and you know where we're at today? Well couple of things. First, the United States is unique in the world. It's an invented country. Its constitution, its government is created at a committee meeting in Philadelphia. The population is a mixture of all sorts of countries and with the immigrants always hated, the Scots-Irish Presbyterians were loathed as incapable of becoming Americans. The Germans were loathed. We loathe every immigrant group uh, that comes through. But that created an artificial society, a, a nation of nations. And we even had the transformation of geography. Think about the Erie Canal, how it connected the Midwest to the coast. This sort of country, there are two things you have. One, technology is really important. And two, the technology, that invention, okay, usually runs out of steam. So for example, uh, the Roosevelt era was driven by the automobile. It made everything. I remember when I was a kid, you know, the new models were coming out. It was huge. And then we kind of, it's, it's a commodity. You buy a car, you don't buy a car, you take Uber, whatever you do. We are now at the point where we had our last era was the Reagan era, only because he happened to be there, okay? The Reagan era was built around the microchip. The introduction of the microchip in 1970, driven by the tax structure that was created that encouraged investment, created this vast industry. And it changed, as the automobile did or electricity did, it changed everything we were. Now, the microchip is no longer cutting edge technology. It's 50 years old. It's 1965 for the automobile. So it's really in there. So we're seeing productivity growth falling. The kind of transformations no longer are there. We were seeing before COVID, we were seeing uh, the cost of money zero. You put money in a bank and you have to pay them almost to take it. Uh, these are all signs of a weakening structure. At the same time, there was a huge social crisis on the one side, there was what I'll call the technocracy. The people who ran these companies, uh, the people at the universities. These are people who live by technocracy in the sense of the knowledge industry. And then there was the declining industrial class in the Midwest and elsewhere. Uh, and they were bitter at the condition that they had been left in. They were ignored by the technocracy. And so the country split right down the middle, still is. On the one hand, there's this class, a lot of other people supported Trump, but this was the class that supported him because they were under attack both economically and, and also uh, culturally. I mean, they had been in churches. There was told that um, homosexuality was a sin, uh, premarital sex was a sin, and now that was a phobia. So you took half the country and made them phobic and also excluded them. If you are a young woman who is in Arkansas and wants to head up a anti-abortion group when you get out of college, your chances of getting to Harvard are a tad slim. In other words, there's a cultural split as well. And that's when the crisis starts. That's when we get these terminal presidents like Nixon, Donald Trump, Biden much less divisive for the technocracy, loathed by the declining industrial working class. And we have the country slip down the middle. And the important part is those who are in the technocracy despise the declining industrial class and their values. Those who are in the declining class despise the technocracy. And so we have a system where the presidential system kind of is a seismograph of uh, chaos. 
could you define, do you have a define a definition, a definitional term that you would sort of use to define the area, area, era that we're in now? I always use the names of the first presidents. Presidents are like diapers. You keep changing them. <laughs> but then really not the critical thing. When Roosevelt took office, he was called by um, Walter Lippmann, the, the least qualified man ever to be president of the United States. And one of the true things about him was he had no idea what he was going to do. He knew he wanted to be president, but he didn't know what he was going to do. Reagan, similarly. Reagan was considered an idiot. Reagan had no idea what he was going to do. Now many revere him, okay? So the important thing is, okay, this is the president who comes in and says, this can't go on. The way we're doing things can't go on, and I'm going to figure out some other system and manages it. We're ways away from that. That comes probably in 2028. Because before that, there's a series of presidencies that are chaotic. You know, like Herbert Hoover, like Richard Nixon, that actually ripped the country apart rather than building it. And that's where we are right now. And the name of the guy who's going to be president, I don't know. But I know who it was. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So let's talk about the 80 year cycle, um, the 80 year institutional cycle. So talk to us about that and, and tell us where, where we're at in that cycle now. This, that cycle happens to change before wars. So first it was the revolution. The Revolutionary War created a republic in which the states were sovereign. The Civil War determined that sovereignty did not mean the ability to leave the republic when they wanted to, limited sovereignty. It changed the relationship institutionally between the state and the federal government. When World War II came, um, the federal government virtually nationalized the economy. It had to. And it introduced a new form of governance, a governance of experts. Dr. Fauci is who I think about for the moment. People who really know it, because that's who won World War II. Those are the guys who built the bombers. Those are guys who designed the nuclear weapons. They're, the experts were the ones who organized everything. The expertise, this happened every 80 years. Again, don't ask me why. We are now in 20, um, in, in five years, we'll be at the 80 year mark. And the federal government is experiencing a deep problem the problem of expertise. Experts are wonderful people at solving problems. They're not very good at understanding the consequences of their solutions, nor understanding the breadth of the problem. Uh, so for example, the Social Security Act was 15 pages long when it was written. The Healthcare Act is 15,000 pages, each section written by a different expert who truly is an expert but it doesn't come together into anything that's understandable, coherent. I don't think anybody's read it, all right? So you wind up in a situation where now the problem, where the problem used to be the relationship of the, govern, of the federal government to the states, now the problem is the relation of the federal government to itself, okay? How does this work? So Dr. Fauci says everybody must wear masks. So we have a close relative who is deaf. He reads lips. If you wear a mask, there's over a million of them. Uh, they can't do it. Now, that's not Fauci's business. So it's not that he was wrong. And it was not that it may not have been the thing that had to be done, but the complexity of society is excluded from the complexity of the problem. And at this point, many people simply don't trust the government. They don't regard the government as honest. They don't regard the government as competent for various reasons. This is from both the left and the right. Uh, there is a sense of government failing. I'll give you one example and we'll go on. Constitution says, Bill of Rights say, I have a right to petition my government. There's no way to for me to petition my government. I had a problem with uh, Medicare because I never signed up for it. I had my own health insurance, I was perfectly happy. Went there, I found out I was gonna be fined. Okay, well, fair enough. So I asked the person, a woman, is there something that can be done? 
And she said, well, the rules are written here and there is nothing that can be done. Is there anyone I could speak to to explain what happened? Well, I don't know. The citizen can no longer petition his government, okay? So if the government is there, in principle, he can petition the government, but in practice, the complexity makes it impossible. So what happened in World War II is you created this institution that was incredibly complex, very competent, and has now run, it's, our problem here is never before in American history has both there been an institutional crisis and a social crisis at the same time. That's gonna come in this decade. So obviously it's gonna be rougher than usual, but it's been so rough, rough in the past that, you know, we had the Civil War, World War II, the Revolution. Uh, we, you know, we are a complex and violent and passionate people. So George, you wrote this book um, before the pandemic. Right. Do you think, you know, what um, influence or what impact does the pandemic have on, you know, your predictions on anything that, and your analyses in, that you wrote in the book? Well, it was interesting because I released the book on February 25th, the day the country shut down. 2020, yeah. Do not release a book on the day <laughs> the country shops. <laughs> Just, you know, it was funny. But what... What COVID did was focus everybody's attention on the federal government. Everybody waited for the president to do a miracle, to invent a vaccine, and he turned to experts and the experts didn't understand the consequences and so on. And everybody looked at the government and said, um, do you guys know what you're doing? And the fact was they sort of didn't, but COVID was a special case, but it became a symbol. And even now when you people don't want to wear masks, and even now when they don't want to take the vaccine, uh, this comes from the fact that they don't really don't trust the expert-driven system that we were in. So true. I do want to, do want to note that I am fully vaxxed. Are you, George? I absolutely am. Excellent. Excellent. So great stuff. I'm going to bring in some audience questions um, and then I want to move on to sort of talking about what's happening in the rest of the world. So we have a great question from Ed. Um, what is it going to take uh, to avoid some of these future risks that you're talking about to the country in democracy? Or do you think that's just an inevitability that we're going to be um, entering sort of this, a, a super turbulent time? I don't think there's any way to prevent it because Creative destruction is a term that Schumpeter, an economist, said. You cannot create something new without destroying what's old. One of the things about the United States is that unlike France, which goes through wars and everything else and stays France, yeah. the United States is still inventing itself. It has all sorts of immigrants coming in. Uh, I don't think that's supposed to be used anymore, but too bad. Uh, they have immigrants coming in, the relationship of the nature of the state is changing, the nature of technology. We are a country that moves rapidly and we exhaust ourselves rapidly. And when we exhaust ourselves, we're bitter. We turn into anger at each other. And that anger clears the deck in the same way that the bitterness of the 1970s about the oil embargo and inflation and unemployment and all the terrible things that were there, clear the deck for the microchip era. And so this country is built for these crises. It was designed for it and in a way thrives on it. It's not a happy time. It's the time when we all despise each other. I mean, what William Jennings Bryan thought of um, Rutherford B. Hayes was amazing. He accused Rutherford B. Hayes of stealing the election, which by the way he did, but that's another issue. So, I mean, the kind of things we're seeing here, we've seen before and where our comfort should come is how many times the same things we were talking about now in somewhat different form was discussed before and overcome. But it's like growing up when you are a, an adolescent. Can't we possibly get you to adulthood a little faster? 
<laughs> oh, no, it's not going to happen. <laughs> when your teenagers turn into aliens, right? Um, <laughs> so do you think it's possible to reestablish faith and trust in the, in the federal government here in the U.S.? Do you think that's a possibility for the future? It will be, but it will be a very different federal government. Uh, the domination of the federal government by, ex by narrow experts, which makes it very difficult to foresee the consequences outside of it, is no longer supportable. You cannot have a government in a democratic society whose operations are in the hands of these experts and set rules that no one can change. So these problems that have arisen out of the success of the previous era really just can't be, you know, the federal government will not fall, but the problems that have arisen, well, at least it won't lead to a civil war. And that's encouraging. Uh, so uh, that's just a benchmark for what it's like at these times. Absolutely. So um, I know that you're familiar with the World Affairs Council audience and in how they really love, uh, we all love to sort of ask global questions. And so here on State of the World, um, we often do what's called the five. So I'm going to ask you about your top five. So what are the top five global trends that you're watching right now um, that will most powerfully shape our future? Well, the first thing is the realignment of the international system and the power of the United States, which is enormously powerful, whatever you say about China and Russia. Not competent, but powerful, okay? The second thing is the European Union cannot survive. European nationalism will remain an instrumental force because it has to be. Thirdly, uh, China is struggling with its identity. It is a very huge economy, but it has only 70, it's 75th in the world in per capita GDP, ranking behind Guyana and Equatorial Africa. China is a very poor country and they're trying to manage themselves as best they can. And so that's gonna be the third thing. The fourth thing is that Africa has got to be transformed by Africans. Africa is a catastrophic situation and it has become more catastrophic between each year. And so you cannot help them. If you help them, you violate the whole thing, but they are gonna to have to sort it out. And that's likely gonna be bloody as they sort it out. And finally, the Middle East will remain the Middle East. It's not going to change. They're going to be Israelis. They're going to be Arabs. They're going to be fighting, arguing, threatening each other. And some things aren't going to change. We have to remember most of the things in the world will stay the same. Excellent. So um, let's let's stay on China for a second. We have two audience questions. So um, you know, one asking about uh, you know why you predict China will eventually fracture, and then a question from Ken who read um, Tom Friedman's review in the today's New York Times, and I don't have the name of the book. Um, but uh, he reviewed a book that sort of uh, proposed some you know several frightening scenarios about the U.S. and China conflicts. Dive a little bit deeper into how you see um, the future of China and the global stage in the, as well as the bilateral US-China relationship. Well, China is already a split country. It's not going to split. West of a certain line, about hundred miles from the coast, the standard of living that exists is among the poorest in the world. The part along the coast has done very well. Mao Zedong, took the long march to raise an army from these people who were impoverished and overthrew the government. Not saying that's going to happen now, but we have to understand when we speak of China, there are at least two very different ones. And the third one is places like Xinjiang, Tibet, uh, Manchuria, Inner Mongolia. And these places are not Chinese. They're not Han Chinese. They are buffer states that are maintained. So China is there is no single statement that sums up China. There's one part of China that has become an engine of the world. And one part of China is so poor that it ranks probably, if we were to rank them, around 100th in the world in income and social standing. What China is doing now is desperately trying to hold it all together, which is the same thing they've been doing for 200 years. How do we hold it together in the face of wealth and poverty and everything else? At the same time, China is the largest 
exporter in the world. The United States is the largest importer in the world. I've been in business. And one of the things I learned in business that was interesting is don't piss off your biggest customer. <laughs> it is easier to find new products somewhere than to find new markets. And this is what the Chinese are facing. This is the situation that Obama began by confronting the Chinese on a bunch of trade issues. Trump continued and Biden is all aboard. Okay, this is now American national policy. The Chinese are threatening a war to invade Taiwan. They won't for a couple of reasons. One, it takes five hours for a landing craft to travel from Taiwan, from China to Taiwan. That's a lot of time for American aircraft or missiles to go meet them. It's, it's, it's hard to, to do this. Second, the US has an enormous alliance. Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, of course, Philippines, depending on the day of the week. Uh, Indonesia, we work with continually. Vietnam, we work with continually. Uh, India now, Singapore, we have a base in Australia. China has not a single military ally. No one has allied with it except Pakistan, which is not necessarily the best one to have. So when people talk about China's global influence, they have to remember the United States has an alliance against China that's larger than NATO in a lot of ways. And China has no allies, it's isolated. So China has done a wonderful job making it appear that it's about to take over the world, okay? But it's got a lot of huge problems and it's unlikely that it's gonna be able to solve them. So we have now many scenarios of horrible things, but let's assume that China invaded Taiwan. The US will close off the Straits of Malacca, which all of China's oil goes through. And we wait as we're waiting now. So for every move that China makes, there's a counter move as there always is. And China would really not have US as a customer at all. It's still a big customer for China. So when I look at the entire map, China is desperately trying to position itself as a significant power, but all of the Asia is rejecting that idea. But you, I know I read reports out of Australia today about sort of the, the Australian military sounding the alarm about, about China. Um, so yeah, well, thank this you. Is one, it's a wonderful time for budget building. So the military will be sounding the alarm. But I mean, the British just uh, ca arrived with a carrier battle group uh, the Queen Elizabeth to the South China Sea. You have a global alliance arrayed against China and China doesn't really have, even Russia couldn't help them because China needs ships, not, man. So again, it's one of the interesting things about old times, I remember the Cold War, the vast overestimation of the Soviet Union. Uh, it's really important to calm down and look at this as we can make a deal, but not if the Chinese are going to insist on being treated as an equal in all things, they're not. Thank you. So I wanna bring in an audience question um, about space. So as we sit here in Connecticut, we are a large aerospace manufacturer and in, in a leader in defense manufacturing. Um, and so much of what we're seeing in the news these days is about SpaceX and in, in, in the International Space Station. Um, how does space play into um, our future cycles? Do you see this as a disruptor as more and more people look to sort of building societies on space or space exploration? How does that play into um, uh, the future? Well, I admit I am now writing a book on space warfare with a Polish friend. So you'll have to come to our Global Security Forum this year. Um, okay. <laughs> well, well, I mean, well, we went into space for a very specific reason, to detect Soviet ICBMs, locate where they were, and prevent their, uh, and be able to knock them out. Same reason the Soviets went there. We, we didn't go into space looking for glory and everything. As we developed it, we developed a relatively minor program from the military point of view, which was Mercury and Apollo and Gemini and so on. 
So men in space were not that important. And to this point, they're not that important. But just as the Portuguese and the Spaniards went into the Atlantic and redefined the world and created an entirely new domain, first of war uh, and then of commerce, the Americans uh, and, the, and others, Chinese and others, are in the process of creating a new domain, which will be of war. And if we follow the pattern in which domains of warfare, uh, domains emerge, that's usually the first stage. The idea of SpaceX is to simultaneously create a, an economic basis. And I think there is a very strong economic basis for going to stick, which is space-based energy. There is one thing that space doesn't have, clouds and night. That's a wonderful place to collect energy, turn it into a millimeter wave that would be transformed into electricity on Earth. So that's one of the things that we can do. So one, it is what's happening in space is enormously important. Two, it's going to be beginning as a military project, always. And I can't even imagine the wealth to be produced there. We'll have to have you back to talk about that book on space. It's becoming um, a very hot topic and something that we're that we've continued to explore here at our council. I have a question about the title of your book. Um, so uh, the title of the book, "Storm Before the Calm." So the word "storm" has been sort of co-opted by QAnon. How do you think conspiracies and conspiracy theories play into the cycles that you've studied? Do you think that we are seeing a large scale detachment from reality that we haven't seen before? Well, I mean, a conspiracy is two people secretly doing something and not wanting everyone to know it. We all engage in conspiracies. What we're referring to is political conspiracies designed to falsify reality. Now, here in Texas, I live close to Austin, which is called the People's Republic of Austin. And in the People's Republic of Austin, there are all sorts of conspiracy theories about what the right wing is doing. The right wing has all sorts of conspiracy theories about what the left is doing. In a time of mistrust, which we're in, we look for explanations. And we don't trust the explanations we're given so we make our enemies look much smarter than they are, engaging in vast conspiracies to kidnap children. I don't even understand that theory, okay? But, you know, it's not like, unlike Vietnam, where the book called uh, Report for Iron Mountain was very popular, showing that we went to Vietnam to make the industri military industrial complex rich, that we had the only reason was that. So, you know, it's a fun time and we can all enjoy it, but it's also one thing to remember. Each of us believed that the things we believe are simply true and the other guy is lying <laughs> and he believes the same thing about you. So here's a question from Sally sort of about your personal, you know, philosophical views. So she wants to know, um, would you say that you are more closely aligned with Thomas Hobbes or uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau? Or neither. <laughs> I would say with, if I had to choose Hobbes, because when I look at the state, if it doesn't have power to impose its will, there's chaos. Rousseau really was saying sort of the same thing. You know, when he was talking about uh, the will of the many, as well as the popular will, the difference between the two he, he really supported the idea of the state being decisive. And our founders were kind of different from all of them. They wanted a, they didn't trust government. But I would have to say that Hobbes really understood that you have to have something that people feared. Otherwise, they won't. The thing I like about conspiracy theorists is I've asked one, gave me conspiracy. I said, so how come you're not dead? I mean, you've got this conspiracy. You know all about it. These powerful people, and they leave you talk about it? You didn't have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
So I, we're starting to come close um, close to our time, but I really want to sort of want to ask you about what does this current moment of turbulence that we're in mean for the U.S. position in the world? Um, you know, so in the upcoming cycle, what do you predict um, for the United States? I've spent a great deal of time in Europe, and the Europeans are always predicting our collapse. <laughs> this time collapsed. It's just bitterness that we arose and they didn't. Power is not opinion. The opinion of how we're doing by the Europeans, who've always regarded that as a decisive point, okay, doesn't translate into the reality of power. The United States is the only country, major country in the world that sits in a continent that cannot be attacked by ground forces. It controls the Atlantic and the Pacific. And contrary to everybody else, has a great lead in space, has been doing this for 60 years. It's hard for that kind of power to decline. It can be done over time. But the idea that the fact that we hate each other this week, that does not just mean the decline of the United States. In fact, the president could be a total incompetent. And there are people who will be both Biden and Trump or those. And yet the republic survives because private life is more important, as the founders put it. So my answer is basically that the rumors of our death are much of but <laughs> overrated, I think. I'm sorry. Just uh, you may know that Mark Twain, his house is just down the street from where I'm sitting now. So well, go ask him what the right last word was. <laughs> so that was quite appropriate. Um. So uh, before you, before we close, you know, for everyone listening, for everyone who's going to pick up your book, um, you know, why do we have a uh, reason to be optimistic as we look at the future? Because we've been this through before, through this before. And we came out more powerful each time. We were through the depression, for God's sakes. The depression that had the Ku Klux Klan off in the darkness, okay? The depression that left ruined lives. And we emerged into the 1950s and leave it to Beaver. My point is that we have lived through this horrible times. We lived through the time after the, the Civil War when the country was impoverished, the government couldn't pay its debts. And the hatred between the populists and the Republicans were just enormous, okay? We should be very confident that if we've done it all those times, which were much worse than this, and the anger was much worse than this, okay? Uh, this one we'll get through. Mr. Friedman, thank you so much for joining us on State of the World today. Um, Thanks, and I look forward to a time where we can welcome you here in person. Thank I'd you for that. spending time with us today. Bye.